Hello everyone. I welcome all the research participants, faculty members, and the guest speakers of the program. Again, with great pleasure to witness the phenomenal event and to be the part of it. The Eurasian Conference on Business Management, Social and Economical Advancements, organized by the Management Institute, the Warsaw University of Life Sciences, Poland, Institute for Service Management, Germany, College of Social Sciences and Humanities, Wilhora University, Ethiopia, and Research Culture Society. Co-sponsored by the uh, Institute of Management and Economy, Eurasian University Scientific Research Association. The objectives of this international conference are to be cleared. Our main objectives the objective is to observe the current scenario towards the advancement of common citizens' lives by improving the theory disciplines of business, management, and economy. The aim of the conference is to provide an international practitioners from academia and industries to deal with the state of the art advancement in their respective fields. Management Institute, the Warsaw University of Life Sciences, I should introduce, uh, introduce to you. Management Institute was established in 2019. The Institute, in its assumptions, conducts research as well as disseminates knowledge in the field of management sciences and quality. And in particular, knowledge management, digital management, or social corporate responsibilities. The institute attach, attaches great importance to cooperation with domestic and in particular foreign universities and other research entities. The institute takes care of the high level of knowledge, skills and competence of its staff. Now, to talk about the university, the Warsaw University of Life Sciences is the oldest agricultural university in Poland and the fourth of the of this type in Europe. Its origin date back to 1816 and are related to the establishment of the Agronomic Institute in Marymount. The advocate of its foundation were Stanislaw Stanzik and Stanislaw Potoki and its first director was Jerzy Benjamin Platt, one of the best experts in economic relations in the Kingdom of Poland. Let me talk about Research Culture Society. Research Culture Society is a government-registered scientific research organization. Society is working for research community at national and international level to impart quality and non-profitable services. Society has successfully organized 100 plus conferences, seminars, symposiums and other educational programs at national and international level in association with different educational institutes. Educational institute and institutions, colleges, universities are welcomed to for memorandum of understanding, MOU that we call free to sign without any charge for academic exchange, knowledge sharing and collaboration to organize events with us. We are promoting and sponsoring educational events as well as publishing research work in collaboration. We also invite sponsorship from the industries, corporates, institutions and government bodies for our educational programs. Now, let me talk in brief about Wilhora University, Ethiopia. It was established to play its part in the national efforts of bringing quality and excellence in teaching, learning, research, community services, and functions, good governance, connecting the development of cultural and natural resources with technology and its applications. The university has laid down structure for relevance and quality of education, research, community service, and good governance. BHU offers a total of 201 programs, of which 100 are undergraduate programs, 82 postgraduate programs, second degree, that means master's, 
and 19th uh, third degree that means phd programs let me talk in brief about the college of social science and humanities it is one of the eight college having five departments 16 bachelor of arts and 17 master of arts and two phd programs in a regular summer and weekend the college has more than 131 on duty and 44 study leave instructors in different field of study to talk about the department of sociology and social work i must mention that at bachelor level 34 students graduated in to June 2021 and 110 students are doing their studies in second, third and final year of study. Very recently, the department has launched Master of Arts in Social Work program to meet the ground needs of West Guji, Plehora Town, Yabelo and Meale Vareda and East Guji, Adola and Miguele towns. Currently, 24 students enrolled and completed their first year of studies. Next, I would talk about College of Business and Economics in brief. The College of Business and Economics is to produce well-trained manpower in the area of business and economics that could contribute towards the development of the country along with the production of professionals, the uh, college shoulders public responsibilities to back, uh, back up the development efforts of the nation uh, through provisions of quality education, society's problem solving research activities, community based services and many others. At present, CVE has enrolled 3000 undergraduate students in 11 programs and more than 500 students in seven master programs and more than 35 students in four phd programs are enrolled in its regular evening and distance education program of accounting and finance management economics logistics and supply chain management and marketing management generally the cbe have around 100 faculty members after this brief introduction of the institutions who are the stakeholders of this event i should quickly proceed to the invited talk so for the first session i welcome here dr harvinder soni professor uh, taxila business school jaipur india director skill with corporation solution please hold the chair as speak as a speaker of this session now let me have the opportunity to introduce Dr. Harvinder Sonima. She is registered as a PhD supervisor and presently guiding eight research scholars. Among them, five scholars have been awarded PhD degree. She has also authored two books entitled Performance Management and a Comparative Analysis of Staff Turnover Intention of Employees in chain and non-chain hotels in Udaipur district. So not taking much of your time, I request Dr. Sony Ma'am to address the audience. Please welcome Dr. Sony Ma'am. Thank you so much, sir, for the warm welcome. Uh, I hope my voice is audible. Ma'am, it is visible. Yes, ma'am. Okay, okay. So, today I'm going to talk about how, with the help of AI and EI, we can optimize the digital transformation. And this is especially relevant because the workplaces have become digital in today's world. And how we can optimize the digital transformation by creating a balance between artificial intelligence and emotional intelligence. Now, why this is important and why we are going to talk about this is that we all know that artificial intelligence and automation, they have increased the efficiency of the business and have also led to the development of society. At the same time, it has opened up new opportunities 
in various areas. Now, the fact is that although new opportunities have been opened and development of the society has taken place, at the same time, the line of tasks between the humans and the machines has been blurred. Now, in such a case, there's no doubt that the senior and the middle level and the junior level employees, their jobs are going to be affected by automation and artificial intelligence. Especially in the short run, the routine tasks which are being performed by the junior level executives and the employees, they are going to be more affected. And in the long run, both the senior and the junior level employees jobs will be affected. Now, in such a case, what can we do to balance artificial intelligence and emotional intelligence? Why we are talking about emotional intelligence is that emotional intelligence is such a skill which the humans are possessing and which it will be very difficult for the machines to emulate. Now, since machines are taking over most of the jobs performed by humans, the organizations and the employees, they need to focus upon the unique human capabilities, which is very difficult for the machines to emulate. But at the same time, we cannot just say that we do not want any kind of digital transformation or we uh, uh, resist this digital transformation because in the present environment, the digitalization has become the need of the hour. If we want to survive in the market, if we want to enhance the market share, we have to go for digital transformation. So what we are going to talk about is that how we can balance both AI and EI for optimization of the digital transformation, which again has become very imperative in the contemporary times. Now, according to Daniel Goldman, who's the New York science writer and also leading expert in the field of emotional intelligence, we are being judged by a new yardstick. And that new yardstick is not concentrating or focusing upon only our training and expertise or our smartness, but it is concentrating upon the way we handle ourselves, the way we manage ourselves, and how do we handle each other. So we are being judged by a new yardstick, not just how smart we are or by our training and expertise, but how well we handle ourselves and each other. Now, when we talk about emotional intelligence, so how did this actually, this term came up and how people started focusing upon this aspect. Basically, it was in 1930s that Edward Thorndike, he first of all talked about the concept of social intelligence. Now he said that social intelligence is how well we get along with other people. So he talked about this part in way back in 1930s. In 1940s also, David Weschler, he talked about the effective components of intelligence, which he said uh, are very essential for success in life. So basically, effective components relate to the moods, feelings, and attitude of people. So people had started recognizing the importance of emotions, the feelings, and social <coughs> intelligence way back. In 1950s also, uh, Abraham Maslow, he tried to explain how we can build up emotional strength. That means how we can control our emotions, how we can manage our emotions, and how we can be emotionally strong. Now, if we talk about the concept of emotional intelligence, it was popularized after the publication of uh, this book, Emotional Intelligence, Why It Can Matter More Than IQ. And 
This was the publication of the psychologist and New York Times science writer, Daniel Goldman. So people started becoming more aware of this term emotional intelligence by around 1995 when this book was published by Daniel Goldman. Now, let's try to first of all understand then we will move to like how what organizations can do in today's world of automation and artificial intelligence uh, in order to build up the EI skills and how EI can help organizations in the present context. So let's first understand like what exactly is an emotion. So in general terms, we all understand that what is an emotion, it is an internal conscious state that we infer in ourselves and others. So basically emotions are personal experiences. Different people, they display different emotions in different situations and also display different emotions in same situations. So they are personal experiences. The, Thing is that we cannot really see the feelings. We can only observe the behavior of people and infer emotions from them. Different people, we may feel happy at times, we may feel sad at other times, at other times we are anxious, sometimes we feel depressed, other times we are surprised. So these are different emotions, but how are they depicted? They are depicted in our behavior. So as I was talking about the in uh, these uh, universal emotions, the six universal emotions are happiness, sadness, fear, disgust, anger, and surprise. <clears throat> now talking about intelligence, now what exactly is meant by intelligence? Uh, they're experts, they have to Okay. So uh, the experts, now what exactly is meant by intelligence? Basically it is our ability to learn from experience and how much we are able to apply our knowledge practically to the surrounding environment. How much we are able to learn from experience and how much we are able to adapt to the surrounding environment. So that basically is meant by intelligence. So what is emotional intelligence? Basically, emotional intelligence is our ability to understand our own feelings, first of all, and then the feelings of others. Now, why is an understanding of our own feelings necessary? So that we can manage our feelings, so that we can motivate ourselves, so that we can not only become self-aware, but we can also exercise self-control over our emotions. But that will be possible only uh, once we first of all understand our feelings. So understanding our own feelings for the purpose of controlling and managing ourselves. And secondly, understanding the feelings of others and accordingly being effective in our interpersonal relations by an understanding of the feelings, the emotions of others. So emotional intelligence is sometimes referred to as people smartness. Now, when we talk about emotional intelligence, uh, let's see that uh, what are the four aspects of emotional intelligence? Is my screen visible? Okay, okay. So please let me know if there's any issue in between. Let me know. Okay. Uh, so when we talk about emotional intelligence, especially in organizational context, the basically there are four dimensions of emotional intelligence. First is self-awareness. So when we talk of self-awareness, it is and understanding of our own emotions and how they affect our performance. See, if we are feeling unhappy, if we are feeling stressed out, it affects our performance at the workplace. So understanding our emotions and also understanding that how they are going to affect our performance. Then self-management. That means how far we can control our emotions and take positive initiatives, like adapting ourselves or having a positive outlook towards problematic situations or emotional self-control. So how far we can manage our emotions. Then 
The third dimension is social awareness. That means how far we are able to understand the emotions of others. How far we are able to understand the situations. How far we are able to show empathy and how aware we are about the organizational culture and context. Now, the fourth aspect is about relationship management. That means this is especially very, very important for leaders. It is, EI is an essential skill for being a successful leader. So managing interactions with others to help them feel and understood. So the leaders, they have to be a good coach. They have to go for team building. They have to go for conflict management and they should also inspire and motivate other employees. So relationship management is again, very, very important in organizational context. Now, uh, basically, we come across different people at different times. So have you met a highly intelligent individual who does not command respect or work well with the team? Sometimes we meet a person who is very intelligent, but people don't respect him much or he's not able to motivate the team or work well with the team. On the other hand, there might be a manager who is not technically gifted, but still he's respected. So, I mean, both the situations are totally different. A manager is highly intelligent, but still people do not give him so much respect and he's not able to get along well with the team. On the other hand, a manager who is not technically gifted, but still he's respected. So how can we explain this? Now, a large number of research has shown that EQ is more important than IQ for success. And in fact, in a research conducted by Daniel Goldman, an individual success in work is 80% dependent on EQ and only 20% is dependent on IQ. So we can see that research has proved that EQ is very, very important for success. And it is not just high IQ, which is going to make people successful in their areas. So 80% of individual success, according to the research conducted by Goldman, depends upon EQ. So basically, what do we mean by uh, being intelligent about emotions, emotional intelligence, how we can be intelligent about our emotions. So it means that we can perceive and use emotions to create optimal relationships and produce desired outcomes. So that is what is meant by being intelligent with your emotions. So how we can perceive and use our emotions to build up good relationships, especially the workplace, especially for the leaders, and also to produce the desired outcome. So uh, people might think that emotional intelligence uh, may be about being emotional at times or uh, it's being about being nice at all times. So emotional intelligence is not being nice about all the time. It is not, it is not actually also about being touchy-feely or being very sensitive about certain issues. It simply means being aware of your feelings and being aware of the feelings of others and how smartly and in a matured way we can handle our own feelings and also we can handle the emotions of others. Now, if we uh, have a look at uh, the signs of low emotional intelligence at the workplace for an employee, some employees, uh, they are highly argumentative. If you give them certain instructions without any logic, they would just argue and put forward their point just the, for the sake of either satisfying their ego 
or for the purpose of avoiding that particular task which has been entrusted to them. So it actually is a sign of low emotional intelligence. That's how employees have the habit of not listening. So emotional intelligence also uh, means having active listening skills because you really cannot understand the feelings and emotions of others unless and until you are a good listener. So the, some of the employees, they do not obey uh, the managers or they do not possess active listening skills. Then there are some employees who cannot handle their emotions at the workplace. They would get uh, stressed out at small problems or they would get very angry with um, petty issues. So emotional outbursts at the workplace, that is also a sign of low emotional intelligence. Then blaming others. Some employees, they have the tendency of blaming others and not taking the responsibility of the work or their failures. That actually is also a sign of low emotional intelligence. So uh, basically, if we have a look at the employee who has high emotional intelligence, he would be able to manage his or her own impulses. He won't act impulsively, will be good at communicating. When we are talking about communicating, we are talking of being a good listener also together with being a good orator. Then that employee is able to adapt himself according to the changes which are introduced in the organization in today's world of digital transformation, many changes are taking place, but how far the employees are able to adapt to the changed environment, that depends upon their uh, level of EQ. How far the employee is able to solve the problem. Most of the employees in organizations, they come up with a problem rather than with a solution. So an employee with high emotional intelligence, he always is a problem solver and not a problem creator. And also such employees, they are also able to keep the environment light and also to, uh, they are able to use their humor to build rapport in tense situations. Such an employee shows empathy. That means he's able to understand the things from the other person's point of view. So that results in conflict management in the organization and then he remains optimistic even in the face of adverse situation. Then even when we talk about the sales situation, a sales executive will be able to educate and persuade the customer effectively if he's high on emotional intelligence. And if a person is working in the customer service role, then he would be able to resolve the customer complaints in a patient manner without uh, losing his temper or without um, giving a harsh reply to a complaining customer. That is possible only when the employee has high emotional intelligence. So the clarity in thinking and the composure in stressful and chaotic situations is what separates top performers from weak performers in the workplace. So that is what is required in a leader. A person who is able to think with clarity, who is able to maintain calm and composure even in chaotic situations will not only become a top performer, but such a person will be able to rise at high levels in the hierarchy of the organization. So it results in, of course, greater career success and stronger personal relationships also results in optimism and confidence and uh, the health problems, like most of the health problems are due to uh, lack of self-management of our emotions, whether we talk about cardiovascular problems or we talk about blood pressure problems or depression, anxiety or the psychological issues. Most of the problems are due to our inability to understand and manage our own emotions. So it is going to result into better health. And when we talk about the professional benefits of emotional intelligence, as I said, for being an effective leader, you need to possess emotional intelligence. It will definitely improve the communication within the organization. The workplace conflicts will be reduced and there will be better problem solving skills in the employees. 
And of course, such employees are more likely to be promoted who are high on emotional intelligence. Now, in a survey which has been conducted by Cap Gemini Research Institute, now this survey has been conducted in 2019. We can see the executives who believe that emotional intelligence will become a must have skill as AI and automation replaces routine tasks. So you can see country wise, the percentage of now, uh, according to the survey which has been conducted by the Cap Gemini Research Institute, we can see the country wise uh, results of the survey the share of executives who believe that emotional intelligence will become a must have skill as AI and automation replaces routine tasks. So uh, you can see the results country wise. India, in India, 95% of the executives who were uh, surveyed, they believe that emotional intelligence will become a must have skill as AI and automation replaces routine tasks. The percentage is 90% in China, 82% in US, 77% in Italy. Then it goes up, for, we, we can see the results in Netherlands, Spain, UK, France, Norway, Sweden, Germany, and overall on an average, 74% of the executives believe that emotional intelligence will become a must have skill, especially in the era of digital transformation and AI. And even when we have a look at uh, the opinion of the non-supervisory employees, so uh, the maximum employees in China, 77% of the employees in China, 73% in India, 44% in Germany, 44% in France, 53% uh, in Netherlands, 57% in US, then we can see the results for Spain, Sweden, Italy, UK, Norway as well. We can see that even employees working at the non-supervisory uh, level, they believe that emotional intelligence will become a must-have skill as AI and automation replaces the routine tasks. Now, here we can have a look at the growth in demand for emotional intelligence skills across countries and sectors. So that means the demand for emotional intelligence skills is growing in the various sectors as well as in countries. So in India, we, uh, it has increased 8.3 times. In US, it is 6.4 times. In Netherlands, it is six times. In Germany, it is 5.2 times. In UK, it is 5.4 times. So we can see that the demand for emotional intelligence skills is increasing as automation and AI has increased. So on one side, um, we are talking about artificial intelligence, but we can see that how the need for AI skills is also increasing. Now, uh, this we can have a look uh, sector wise. That means, to what extent will automation and AI lead to increase in demand for emotional skills in which sector? So, the maximum demand for AI skills will be in finance sector, insurance, then retail banking, automotive. It is six uh, times more the demand is going to increase with increase in automation and AI. Retail, in consumer products industry, in utilities, it is going to increase 5.7 times. So as uh, the a demand for AI is increasing, at the same time, we can see that the demand for EI is also increasing. So uh, definitely it leads to increased productivity and efficiency for the organization, higher employee satisfaction and increase in market share even the attrition rate becomes lower. So in a survey uh, that was conducted on the employees or the, rather the sales agents of L'Oreal company, um, like it was found that employees who were hired on the basis of their high emotional skills, they were able to outperform the other sales, the remaining sales force uh, by US dollars 91,370 uh, in their sales performance. And even the attrition rate of the employees 
was 63% lesser than the attrition rate of the low, uh, other employees. So that means uh, emotional intelligence definitely has an impact upon the uh, productivity and efficiency of the employees and also the attrition rate of the uh, employees who are high in EQ, that is lower. Then uh, it results in, uh, if we talk about individually, the employees, how it benefits, it results in better mental and emotional well-being. The employees are able to uh, manage their work-life balance in a better manner. The fear of job loss, that also becomes lesser and there is greater collaboration between the employees. So here we can have a look that uh, according to the Gallup survey, we can see that the US workers, they feel uh, that leadership is not caring much for their well-being. So you can see that here in this particular Gallup survey report, 35% of the employees, they strongly agree. Only 35% that my organization cares about my overall well-being. So that means the fewer US workers uh, in March, in January 2021, it is uh, something around 38%, but in uh, 21 March, it has reduced further and only 35% of the employees agree that my organization cares about my overall well-being. So that will be possible only when the organizations, the leaders, they are emotionally intelligent and they are able to uh, focus upon the understanding of the emotions and feelings of the employees. Not only this, organizations are using emotion AI at present to understand that uh, how the body language, the facial expressions and the voice intonation depicts the emotional state of the consumers, of the employees. So that is known as emotion AI. That means artificial uh, intelligence is being used in today's world to understand the emotions and the verbal, non-verbal cues of not the consumers, employees, and the other stakeholders. So what is basically emotion AI? It measures facial expressions of em uh, emotion, and basically what happens is the machine learning algorithms, they analyze the pixels on the face and they classify the facial expressions. And the, the combination of these facial expressions are then mapped to emotions. So uh, you can see that how with the help of AI, you can see it's smile, 100, joy, 99.91%. These are being measured with the help of uh, AI. Contempt, anger, expressiveness. With the help of AI, the emotions can be actually understood and measured. So then how emotion AI is being used? So it is being used to analyze how consumers respond to the digital content, such as videos and ads and even TV shows. And this helps the media companies, brands and advertisers to improve their advertising. And not only this, they can be embedded into apps, games, devices, and digital experiences. And also it can be integrated with other technologies to make them emotion aware. For conducting market research also, uh, emotion AI plays a very important role. So some companies are using uh, softwares to understand the uh, emotions of the consumers, how they are reacting to the advertisement, how they're responding to the advertisement, and they are using it for market research purpose. And for workplace safety, the physical safety of employees, you can, with the help of emotion uh, AI, you can see and understand the for if there's a fatigue on the face of the employee, that means he's at a great, or there's stress on the face of the employee. It means that he's on a uh, risk of uh, any accident. So a proactive step can be taken to prevent any industrial accidents. For supporting mental health also, emotion AI softwares are being used in on a proactive basis to take better clinical decisions. Even in call centers, the uh, voice analysis of the call center employees is done 
to understand whether they are speaking with empathy, whether they are speaking in a pleasant manner and they are uh, able to uh, convince the other parties in a positive manner and the results are being used for training them to uh, be uh, better call center employees. So uh, now in the end, like how organizations can develop a more emotionally intelligent workforce. So the organization can take steps to customize existing learning programs to integrate EI and make them accessible to all. And they can identify the key EI skills that are important for their workforce. And they can also uh, develop training programs at the various career levels and at the various functional levels, which can be customized according to the needs of the organization and the needs of the employees. So here you can see that how in various countries, the uh, organizations are conducting training in emotional intelligence uh, and country-wise results for the senior management and the junior level employees. This is according to Capgemini Research Institute. Like you can see the results for China, then uh, for France, Germany, India, US, UK, Netherlands. So that means the organizations are focusing upon conducting training in emotional intelligence with the increase of automation and artificial intelligence. Even the uh, organizations, they can modify the recruitment process to include the evaluation of EI. So while hiring the employees, the emotional intelligence needs to be checked so that they can, the organizations, they can hire employees with uh, greater and higher level of emotional intelligence. Even while promoting and rewarding the talent, the EI lens needs to be applied. And in order to build high EI culture, technology and data can be used. So that means we need to create a balance between artificial intelligence and emotional intelligence. We need to build up that kind of culture where we can measure EI and we can work upon it and we can create a win-win situation for the organization and optimize digital transformation in the entire globe. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Greek schools. She has been awarded many national and international prizes over 120, and she is a Global Teacher Award. She has won a Global Teacher Award 2020 and 21. Uh, she is a winner, uh, a Global Teacher Prize uh, finalist, nine, uh, 2019, Warke Foundation. Recently, she has been selected as Global Icon 2020, featured in Fashion Vista magazine, among the top 10 women entrepreneurs featured in Fortune and among the 100 most successful women in business, featured in an Amazon book by Global Trade Chamber. She promotes STEM region by introducing STEM in astronomy and physics projects and combines STEM with language teaching. She is the founder and international coordinator of many innovative international projects that focus on the United Nations. Sustainable Development Goals describes in 2030 Agenda. She is also an author of scientific books for kids. Furthermore, she is a social activist, a global peace ambassador, senior advisor of United Nations Peacekeeper Federal Council, and ambassador of the um, Ecumenial Delphic Union. She is also a member of Educational Committee of the Ecumenial Delphic Union in collaboration with Harvard University and International Ambassador of Volunteerism and Education of the Greek Academy of Volunteerism, Hel Hellas. She has received many humanitarian 
and its thoughts on international humanitarian organizations. So now with me, please welcome Dr. Raina Lampao, ma'am. Over to you, ma'am. Good afternoon uh, from Greece. Uh, congratulations for the organization of this uh, wonderful event, uh, this conference. I'm very, very honored to participate uh, in this great event. Uh, I warmly thank Greece's Culture Society and especially Shirak Patel for uh, this kind invitation. So today I'm going to present uh, the topic of strategic human resource management and why because so we have seen how nowadays globalization of companies and capital markets uh, over the past uh, two decades have changed the business landscape and all of these trends are pushing companies to manage uh, their assets as effectively as possible, especially uh, their human assets. Uh, so uh, can I share my presentation? Uh, resource management the discipline has witnessed a great deal of change over the past years, and these changes represent two major transformations. The first uh, is the transformation from being the field of personal management to being the field of human resource management. And the second is the transformation from being the field of human resource management to being the field of strategic human resource management. The first transformation incorporated the recognition that people are an important asset in organizations and can be managed systematically. And the second is based upon the recognition that human uh, resource policies and practices should be coordinated each other and should be linked with the needs of the organization. Since the early of uh, uh, 90, 90, uh, the decade of 90s, academics have proposed at least three uh, models to differentiate between ideal types of HR strategies. The first model is what we call control-based model. Uh, this uh, first approach to modeling uh, different types of um, uh, HR strategy uh, is based on the nature of workplace and control and more specifically on managerial behavior to direct and monitor employee role and performance. So according to this perspective, management structures and HR strategy are instruments and techniques to control all aspects of work uh, to, to, uh, to secure a high level of labor productivity and corresponding level of profitability. The most important is the second one, which is actually related to uh, the strategic uh, human resource management. The second approach um, is what we call a resource-based model. Uh, it's grounded in the nature of the reward effort exchange, and more specifically, the degree to which managers view their human resources as an asset, uh, as opposed to a very variable cost. That means that superior performance through workers is uh, underscored where uh, advanced technology and other uh, inanimate in, in resources are readily available to competing firms. So the sum of people's knowledge and expertise and social relationships has the potential to provide non-substitutable uh, capabilities that serve as a source of competitive advantage. We're going to see this concept very important of competitive advantage. And we have also a second model that we call uh, integrative uh, model, which is actually a combination of uh, uh, the two of them. Um, so here you can see, uh, why uh, we there are some values, values and guided principles about uh, how we can manage people. HR strategies defining the direction in which human resource management intends to go. Policies, uh, guidelines defining how these values, principles, strategies should be applied and implemented in specific areas. Processes consisting of the formal procedures to put the HR strategies um, and, and platinum supplies and policies into effect. Practices, of course, how uh, to, um, uh, what, which approaches you will use in order to manage people and how will you implement them. And uh, pro uh, programs, um, all these strategies, policies and practices to be implemented according to uh, planification. And also we can mention the 5P as we say, um, it's actually stimulating what, what we call 
uh, uh, a, a model that stimulates and reinforces different employee role behaviors appropriate for each competitive strategy. And we have philosophy, policy, programs, practices, and uh, processes. And what are uh, the aims of uh, this uh, human resource management generally? The overall purpose of resource management is to ensure that the organization is able to achieve success through people. So these systems can be uh, a source of organizational capabilities that allow companies to learn and capitalize on new opportunities. Uh, so uh, we have seen some uh, uh, specific policy goals according to experts, managing people as assets that are fundamental to the competitive advantage of the organization, aligning uh, human resource policy, management policies with business policies and corporate strategy, developing a close fit uh, of HR policies, procedures, and systems with one another, creating um, a flexible organization capable of responding more quickly to change, encouraging team working and cooperation across individual organizational boundaries, create a strong customer first philosophy, uh, and throughout the organization, empower employees to managing their own uh, self-development and learning, develop reward strategies designed to support the performance-driven culture, improve employee improvement um, uh, involvement through better internal communication, build greater employee commitment to the organization, and uh, also increase uh, line management responsibility for HR policies. And finally, develop the facilitating role uh, of managers as uh, enablers. And what are the criteria for um, an effective human resource uh, strategy? An effective uh, strategy is one that works in the sense that it achieves what it sets out to achieve. Uh, in particular, it will satisfy uh, satisfy big things. Uh, <laughs> we decided on detailed analysis and study, not just with thinking. Uh, it can be turned into actionable programs that anticipate implementation requirements and problems. It's coherent, coherent and integrated. It's being composed uh, on components that fit and support each other. It takes account uh, of the needs of uh, line managers and employees, and employees uh, uh, generally, as well as those of the organization and other stakeholders. And um, uh, this uh, uh, HR planning should aim to uh, meet uh, the needs of the key stakeholder groups involved in people management in the company. Now, very important, the concept of strategy. The concept of strategy is based on a number of associated concepts that we need to explore. Competitive advantage, distinctive capabilities, strategic intent, strategic uh, capability, resource-based strategy, strategic management, strategic goals, and strategic plans. First of all, I will say that uh, this is very, very important because a competitive advantage arouses out of uh, a company creating value for its customers. So to achieve this, companies select markets in which they can excel and they can present a moving target to their competitors by continually improving their position. So here we need uh, to emphasize uh, also um, and the differentiation uh, because we have uh, uh, the competitive advantage which is actually uh, when a company presents uh, uh, something that uh, others uh, will be able to copy to imitate but we have at the other part what we call sustainable and sustained competitive advantage which is something that competitors cannot imitate and this is distinctive capabilities. Uh, so achieving a competitive advantage through human resources must be based on the unique combination of organizations, human capital strategy, and core capabilities that differs from organization to organization. Um, <clears throat> a well-known framework of these uh, three generic strategies is co comprised innovation, quality, and cost leadership organization can use to gain competitive advantage. These are the criteria. And uh, also, um, is uh, um, we need to see that the human resources are very, very important, are very important and valuable because they improve the efficiency and effectiveness of organization. Uh, as I said before, the human resources should be difficult to emulate and cannot be easily copied by others. 
Uh, and the human resources should be organized so that employee talents can be combined and deployed as needed. And human resources should be rare because employees' knowledge and skills should not be equally available to competitors. And um, of course, uh, this uh, um, uh, perspective encourages proactive rather than reactive behavior. Company calls are communicated explicitly. Uh, there is a focus uh, on gaps between current situation vision of the future. Uh, human resource opportunities and constraints are identified and implementing plans. And here we have uh, uh, what we said before about the city capabilities. Um, so these are the opportunity to, for companies to sustain competitive advantage is defined by their capabilities. So a distinct capability can be described as an important features that, as I said before, confers superiority on the organization. And uh, um, this is what I said before, the distinction between distinct capabilities and uh, reproducible capabilities. Distinct capabilities are those that cannot be replicated by competitors or can uh, only be imitated with uh, great difficulty. And reproducible capabilities are those that can be bought or created by any company with reasonable management skills, diligence, and financial resources. Um, most uh, uh, technical capabilities we know that are reproducible. <clears throat> So uh, we need innovation, as I said before, and leadership in order to, um, to have a sustainable um, competitive advantage. Uh, the most also, uh, we can say that the most uh, distinctive capability, according to expert, is that it will be presented by the knowledge, by skills and expertise and commitment of employees of organization. So actually human assets, are the distinctive capability of every organization. That's why they need to invest on this. Uh, this uh, philosophy shows all the need for investment of human resource management and training, etc. We're going to explore that. Um, and what are uh, the criteria for deciding whether a resource can be regarded as a distinct capability or competency, value uh, creation for the customer, Rarity compared to the competition, non-imitability, non-substability. And uh, here we have uh, other forms of uh, um, strategic uh, strategy and a related strategic management that we're going to explore later. Strategic goals uh, define where the organization wants to be. Strategic plans, formal expressions of how organization intends to attain its strategic goals. Strategic intent, um, a broad uh, vision of what organization should be, and the mission combines also includes the mission, the specific goals, specific objectives, and the strategic uh, capability. Uh, so uh, what are the strategic goals of uh, human resource uh, management? Uh, of course, to invest, invest uh, in people um, through learning processes to increase uh, skills and capabilities to ensure that organizations identifies the knowledge required to meet its goals and satisfy customers, to define the behaviors required for organizational success and ensure that these behaviors are encouraged and rewarded, to encourage people to engage uh, thoroughly in their work and to gain the commitment of uh, uh, people's organizations, uh, mission and values, and to achieve uh, these goals necessary to understand uh, the link between human resource management and uh, um, business strategy. Uh, strategic capability actually refers to the ability of the organization to develop and implement the strategies that will achieve sustained competitive advantage and the ability to select the most appropriate vision to define realistic intentions to match resources to opportunities and prepare and implement uh, strategic plans. Now we have uh, the most well-known uh, model, which is called the resource-based uh, model view, as I said before. And this is, uh, um, it means that the strategic capability of a company depends on its resource capability. Strategy is the balance between the exploitation of existing resources and the development of the new ones. So strategic human resource management concerns the role human resource management systems play in a company's performance. And it focuses on the alignment of human resources as a means of gaining competitive advantage. And um, what uh, are, are um, all these? Uh, what uh, uh, what are all these aspects of strategic human resource management? 
It comprises the full scope of organization activities, including uh, corporate uh, objectives and organizational boundaries, matching the activities organization of to the environment. Um, uh, ensure that the internal structures, is practices, procedures enable the organization to achieve its goals, uh, matching the activities organization it to its resource capability to acquire and reallocate resources and to translate the dynamic set of external and internal variables that organization faces uh, into a structured set of clear future objectives that then can be implemented. And what are the principles of um, strategic human resource management? That there is always a purpose and the human resource dimensions of that purpose are evident. There's a process, a process of developing strategy with organization is understood and is an explicit consideration of human resource dimensions. Their effective um, links uh, um, to ensure the integration of human resource consideration with the decision-making processes of the organization and uh, the organization of all levels establishes responsibility and accountability for human resource management. Initiatives also are relevant to the needs of the business always in the management of human resource. That there are many cases where managers, you know, um, act on their own. I mean, they don't uh, uh, collaborate with directors, et cetera. So this is a problem of human resource management and includes the responsibility uh, to identify and interact in the social, political, technological, and the ecological uh, environments in which organization um, um, act, uh, act. So what are uh, the aims of strategic human resource management? The aims include human resources, management is fully integrated with the strategy and, and strategic needs of the field. Policies cohere both across policy areas and across um, hierarchies. And uh, practices are adjusted, accepted, and used by uh, line managers and employers uh, as part of their everyday work. And uh, also very, very important and very relevant today, we talk about soft skills and uh, hard skills. So soft uh, strategic human resource management plays emphasis on the human relation aspect. So uh, we talk about all the soft skills we know, communication, collaboration, involvement, uh, security of employment, quality of working, balance of life and work uh, life. And uh, the other part, the hard uh, strategic human resource management, which comprises the hard skills, um, it will emphasize uh, how to invest in human resource management in the interest of uh, uh, the business. A new concept, which is very, very uh, trendy now, it's uh, what uh, we call corporate uh, social um, responsibility. It is actually, um, it's how, uh, how a, a business, uh, how a company acts uh, for the social good. For instance, uh, this is related to, to green entrepreneurship or social inclusive entrepreneurship, how this uh, could be for the uh, social good for humanity, how uh, the, uh, the access of the company do not harm environment, for example, or do not harm uh, vulnerable groups, etc. cetera. Uh, so we need a social good beyond the interest of the companies. And uh, um, the basis of strategic human resource management are that, uh, first of all, the human resources, human capital play a strategic role in success as before, as a major source of competitive advantage. HR strategies should be degraded uh, with, uh, with business plans, what we call vertical integration, and individual strategies should cohere by being linked to others to provide mutual support. It's what we call horizontal uh, integration. And what are the concepts of uh, strategic um, measures management? The resource-based view, we analyzed that earlier, strategic fit and strategic flexibility. Strategic fit, uh, of a research resource-based view, I'm uh, saying again, that it's actually the range of resources, including resource, resource management, that we said before about competitive advantage. And uh, um, we have uh, here also the strategic fit, which entails the link of human resource management practices with the strategic management processes of the organization. Uh, this is the vertical uh, uh, option. And our horizontal uh, option is that it emphasizes the coordination or concurrence among the various human resource management uh, practices. We have also strategic flexibility with the ability of the company to respond and adapt to changes in its competitive environment. 
Um, what are the perspectives on um, strategic human resource management? There are actually many perspectives. Um, according to research, there is always this universalistic perspective, according to which some practices are better than others. And this is a universal relationship. There is a universal relationship between individual best practices and fair uh, company performance. Uh, there is also another uh, perspective which is called contingency perspective that in order to be effective organization must be consistent with other aspects of organizations. And uh, uh, also we have a configuration perspective which is actually more holistic approach emphasizes uh, of how um, independent variables are related to the dependent variable of organizational performance. Uh, and uh, we have uh, some uh, approaches according to this, what we call the best practice approach. This is a set of best uh, uh, practices uh, that uh, um, are universal in the sense that they are best in any situation. We have also uh, a list of uh, uh, best practices. Um, here we can see employment security, selective hiring, self-management teams, high uh, compensation conditions of performance, sharing information, um, <clears throat> reduction of status, um, uh, differential sharing information, as I said before. And this is the best fit approach also in this can be perceived in terms of vertical integration or alignment between organizational business or HR strategies. Uh, according to the best fit approaches, strategies should be um, uh, aligned with the context and circumstances of uh, the organization. And uh, um, the best fit process, as I mentioned before, is innovation, being the unique producer, quality, delivering high quality goods and services to customers, and cost leadership, uh, the planned result of policies aimed at managing away expenses. Uh, according to the configuration, organizations will be more effective if they adopt the policy of, of strategic configuration by matching the strategy to one of the ideal types uh, defined by uh, theories. And we have also uh, some uh, types of organizations we need to see uh, here are uh, what we call prospectus, which operate in an environment uh, characterized by rapid and uh, unpredictable changes. We have defenders, uh, which operate in a more stable and uh, predictable uh, environment. Uh, so they engage in more long-term uh, planning. We have the analyzers. Uh, the analyzers usually, um, uh, they have, uh, uh, they are a combination of the two previous, inspector and defender types. And we have reactors which are unstable operations existing uh, um, yeah, because they believe that they are, um, they have to face an unpredictable environment. And uh, we have uh, uh, what we call bundling. Um, and here, the development and implementation of several practices together that are interrelated and they complement sometimes each other. So according to what we have seen so far, how all the theory of strategic human resource management could be applied in practice in how could be um, a strategic human resource ma management model should be. Um, a model, uh, a strategic approach should have the following steps. First of all, uh, uh, it involves uh, the organization mission. Uh, the analysis of internal and external environment, uh, of course, uh, uh, the comparison after. And we're going to see what I'm talking about. First of all, <clears throat> We need to assess the organization, environment, and mission set before. Uh, we need to formulate the organization um, business strategy to uh, identify human resource requirements based on the business strategy, to compare human resource inventory, numbers, characteristics, and practices, develop HR strategies based on the differences between the current inventory and future requirements, and implement appropriate human resource practices to reinforce the business strategy and attain competitive advantage. Um, I remember that changes in uh, uh, external and internal environments have always a direct impact on how organizations are run and people are managed. So um, environmental scanning is very, very important systematic monitor of major environmental forces impacting the organization. Uh, and internally also changes may uh, appear in terms of organization strengths and weaknesses. Uh, so um, uh, the organization's mission, visions, value, all that we said before externally, internally should be assessed in order to define appropriate business strategy model. 
so um, we talk about internal external assessment uh, institution uh, element changes in the legal, regulatory, climate, economic conditions, labor market realities. Um, all of that uh, should be taken into consideration. And as I said before, also this uh, comprises uh, organizational strengths and weaknesses um, and human resource skills, knowledge, a, a portfolio of them. Uh, after one, we have the mission um, because this is uh, 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 at the first in, uh, we need to formulate and incorporate a business strategy and doing an analysis of organization strengths, weaknesses, opportunities uh, through uh, what we call a SWOT analysis, a model, it's very well known. Uh, because uh, this uh, model shows the strengths and weaknesses of the, uh, of the organization. Um, HR strategy formulation after this implementation, uh, the outcomes. Um, so this, uh, this strategy uh, includes uh, a strategy planning, uh, planning interpretation and recruitment selection placement. And we have also development and uh, development strategy, performance management, training, development, career planning, and what we call compensation strategy. Compensation strategy comprises salary structure and employee incentives. Um, and uh, organization should provide, uh, when we talk about outcomes and performance, that means that organization should provide its workforce with job security with meaningful work, with safe conditions of employment, equitable financial compensation, and a satisfactory quality of work life. Organizations cannot attract and retain the number, type, and quality of professionals required to deliver uh, services if the internal work environment is unattractive. So employees uh, are a valuable stakeholder group and uh, uh, should be taken into consideration because uh, of the complexity of service that they provide. Job satisfaction, commitment to the organization, employee management, motivation, level of job stress, and other constructs are uh, usual measures of employee attitude and uh, HR outcomes. And we have human capital metrics, which are actually contribute to the organization bottom line, what we call um, a theory, and this, uh, um, uh, actually, measures is what we said before to measure um, uh, the uh, strengths and weaknesses. And uh, uh, finally, organizational outcomes and performance, growth, profitability, competitive advantage, legal compliance, strategic objectives, attainment, key stakeholder, all key stakeholder satisfaction are outcome measures of that can be used to define how well organization is performing in the marketplace and whether it is producing the service that is valued by customers. So key stakeholder satisfaction uh, may include, um, for instance, uh, uh, indexes, uh, basic, um, client satisfaction or a community perception. Um, and of course, the mission and objectives are uh, reflected in the outcomes uh, that the manager stresses in the strategies, general tactics of the organization. So before uh, concluding, I want to say that uh, management is a holistic approach. And uh, actually, managers at all levels are becoming increasingly aware that critical sources of competitive advantage include appropriate systems for attracting, motivating, and uh, uh, managing the organization human resources. So adapting a strategy, uh, a strategic view of human resources involves considering employees as human assets and developing appropriate policies and uh, uh, programs to increase the value of these assets to organization in the marketplace. Effective organizations realize that their employees have value, much as the organization's physical and capital assets have value. So viewing human resource management from an investment perspective, rather than as variable cost of production, allows organizations to define how to best invest in its people, something that leads to a dilemma. Uh, organization that does not invest in uh, employees may be less attractive to current and prospective employees, which causes inefficiency, as we said before, and weakens organization competitive position. And uh, the other part of organization, if organization invests in its people, needs to ensure that these investments are not lost by developing strategies to retain employees uh, long enough to realize an acceptable return on its investment in employees and uh, skills and knowledge. So strategic management, as I said before, is holistic, is concerned with uh, its um, 
um, perceives organization as a total system and uh, also it addresses uh, what needs to be done across the organization as a whole. Um, of course, uh, we don't talk about isolated programs and techniques. Uh, we talk about the ad hoc uh, development of HR practices. Thank you uh, very much. If you have any question, I uh, am here to reply. Contribution is such more valuable for our research scholars. The models of uh, human resource uh, resources and uh, concept of five weeds shared by you are very much valuable. Now, for the next session, I know everyone is ready to go deep into the world of wisdom through the speeches of our speakers. Hence, with this positive approach, let us begin the third session. And with you, I welcome the speaker of the session, Dr. Anna Jasulevich, Assistant Professor, Management Institute of Warsaw, University of Life Sciences, Warsaw, Poland. I would like to introduce Dr. Anna Jasulevich to you in brief. Dr. Anna Jasulevich is Assistant Professor in Institute of Management, Warsaw, uh, University of Life Sciences. She is a member of Polish Scientific Society of Marketing, head of postgraduate public procurement studies, theme editor in the International Journal Annals of the Marketing Management and Economics. She is researcher in international and national projects and author of several dozen scientific publications, organizer of the international conferences and reviewer of scientific papers in international journals. Her research areas include consumer behavior, enterprises innovative marketing strategies, and sport marketing. As part of the teaching and research internship, she was a lecturer and researcher in University of Azores, Universidad de Marcia, Mugla Stikti, uh, Kokman University, Alanya Alladin, um, Kikubats University, National University of Life and Environmental Sciences of Ukraine, uh, Slovak University of Agriculture, Russian State Agri Agrarian University, Moscow, uh, Timirizhev Agriculture Academy, St. Petersburg State Agrarian University. So, with great round of applause, Please welcome Dr. Anna Jasulevich. Over to you, ma'am. Okay, thank you very much for introducing me. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I will try now to share my screen and please. Um, okay. Um, let's see if it is uh, shared already. Um, I will try to make the. I'll try to make the slideshow and change the slide. Do you see another slide now, presentation schedule or not? To talk about the social responsible consumer behavior, I will show you some definitions because as you probably know, uh, the very interesting Rania Lampour presentation was also connected with uh, social responsibility. Um, but it was connected with the corporate social responsibility and there are definitions regarding this topic. But uh, if we talk about the social responsible consumer behavior, the situation is different because we don't have any uh, definition in law. So you, we should uh, look for some definitions in the scientific publications. And I uh, found some definitions and I'll show you the, them. And next, I will go into the role of mobile applications in educating social responsibility. Uh, I think that it is nowadays hot topic using uh, modern uh, high technologies to learn uh, uh, social responsibility and also to start to Sorry, to educate social responsibility. And then uh, uh, I'll talk a little bit about the types and examples of mobile applications. Uh, I'll talk a little 
we can use to create social responsibility um, you, we can use that we can teach uh, we can use to teach students about the social responsibility and then um, i would like also to present very very briefly the preliminary research uh, results of own research uh, because this study is still uh, conducting uh, now at now and that's why this uh, I will present only con conclusions on preliminary research results. And here uh, I would like to show some uh, definitions on um, social responsibility. We may say that such kind of responsibility is very related, very closely related to corporate social responsibility. And according to the uh, to the scientists, for example, to Rodriguez and Ricard, there is a specific correlation between the enterprise and the consumer in the area of uh, social uh, responsibility. Why? Because on one hand, um, it is the attitude of consumer and uh, the choices of consumer, uh, of consumers, of course, that um, force entrepreneurs force companies uh, to take pro-social and also pro-environmental actions. And on the other hand, uh, that what can make us as a consumers loyal to company is the decision of entrepreneurs to undertake uh, the initiatives for the benefit of local community, for the benefit of environmental protection, or for the the vanity of society in general. And uh, researchers, uh, researchers for, from various disciplines, they indicate that um, in order to find uh, such solutions that effectively balance uh, planet, people and profits, uh, a new ways of educating about the responsibility are needed a new ways of learning such responsibility and new ways of teaching uh, pupils and students such uh, uh, responsibility are nowadays necessary. So following this line of thinking, it seems logical that uh, new ways of teaching social uh, responsibility should be fostered in order to, uh, to face major societal uh, challenges and more and more researchers uh, are emphasizing the need to transform the education to introduce uh, a new approach to uh, in, in this field for example stravista uh, points out that to be a, sustain, a very sustainable manager in the future student must develop a passion for sustainability as a pre prerequisite. And I think that regarding this thinking, we can talk also about the very, very big need of introducing uh, the new technologies to learn about social uh, so, uh, respons uh, responsibility uh, for our students. We are teachers here. We learn different issues using um, traditional and also and also modern techniques. And one of these techniques can be also. And I encourage to this. And I will try to prove you now that it is uh, a good idea. One of the, such techniques are mod mobile applications. And. Um, Current pupils, we, we may take into the account that current pupils, current students are very different from pupils and students from years ago. Of course, we were also students, but we used different uh, methods to socialize, to uh, learn uh, also in every area of our life than the students nowadays. Today's students are digital natives. What it means? It means that they grew up in the digital age and instead of acquiring digital knowledge 
as the adults, as we do, they um, have this knowledge starting when they were born. Uh, yes, they, we may say that um, they have this, that acquire, they acquire this knowledge from the beginning of their life. And uh, the revolution in smartphone technology, this revolution caused that young people nowadays, they socialize, they gain access to information and they perform uh, daily activities using mobile applications, different kinds of mobile applications. However, please notice that the education in recent years has still been carried out using the same pedagogical methods as it was 20 years ago. Of course, the situation a bit changed regarding the situation connected with the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. We started to use the new technology nowadays, but still uh, there is a lot of area, um, area to improve in the education for us as the teachers. Why uh, mobile applications? Why we could take into account such a way of teaching students? Because application offer in particular young people new ways of looking at environmental uh, and ethical problems that are related to the production and also consumption. Um, mobile applications um, mobile applications can encourage, encourage critical thinking. They can encourage the development of problem-solving skills and the emotional uh, uh, value, uh, emotional, uh, let's say, emotional thinking about the values connected with the uh, society and the environment. And more um, importantly, apps are very interactive method of uh, teaching and learning uh, because they transform the teaching process from passive to active uh, and they involve uh, activities where the users of applications, let's say students in this case, learn social responsibility very easily and they are interested in such kind of learning. And now I would like to say a bit about the kinds of applications. We have different kinds of application, different types of application, let's say, and some examples I would like to show uh, today. Uh, we have um, the range of apps that enable consumers to learn about the health effects um, of given uh, products. And uh, in Poland, for example, for example, we have such application as e-numbers, uh, e-ingredients, we read flavors. Um, these are these uh, names uh, mentioned here. These are Polish, mainly Polish, not all of them, but mainly Polish applications. But I'm sure that in your countries, you also have uh, your national applications and international applications that students can use to learn about the health effects of products they consume. Um, we have also. Um, and the applications uh, that uh, I'm sorry that um, uh, enable consumers to learn about the use of animals for laboratory tests by companies. There are the countries where it is forbidden to use the animals for tests, but the majority of the countries uh, uh, in the world still use such tests. So such applications can be also uh, very good for, uh, for using for those who care about the, uh, about the animals. It's, uh, we have such uh, application as Bunny Free, Cruelty Cutter, Choose Cruelty Free, etc., and so on, so on. And some of them are well known already all over the world. Some of them has more than one million, million users uh, nowadays. We have also the apps that encourage buyers to learn about ethical and unethical corporate practices for the employees and 
uh, also uh, for environment. Uh, we have uh, here, uh, we have here such application as good on you. We have application uh, fair uh, fashion. There are also, uh, of course, some other applications. This one, good on you, is one of the most known uh, nowadays, uh, not only in Poland, but uh, in the world. We have applications that allow, uh, that allow consumers to exchange, to sell, and to buy used things. And we have such applications as Vinted or United Wardrobe. For example, in Poland, uh, application Vinted is uh, very often used, not only by students, but other age groups as well, because this is an application where you can exchange your, for example, clothes, furniture, and other stuff. If it is still good, you can uh, sell it or exchange it. Also, you can buy the used things as well. It, it is some, uh, somehow also a kind of, uh, uh, of responsible uh, behavior. Um, and we have also apps that enable uh, consumers to learn about the fight against food waste. And uh, they enable consumers to buy a food. This is a very uh, good application that developed a lot during the pandemic. COVID-19, because as you know, for a long time, the restaurants were closed and the restaurants um, suffered um, because of that fact a lot. And they tried to sell um, the food, um, providing the, this the del delivery to home, but still they had a problem with the a large waste of food products. And they started to use this application uh, too good to go, for example, to sell a product uh, at the end, for example, the day, uh, at the end of the day, to send, to send the meal, the meals at the end of the day uh, for a small amount of money for consumers. And some uh, of such meals, they were also given as a charity for needed uh, people. And this application de developed a lot and it is still uh, used and popular. And we have also apps that enable consumers to support national and local producers. If we are ethnocentric, you want to uh, support our national economy, you can also uh, start to use such applications. For example, in, in Poland, we have a Pola application, we have Polish brands application. Probably, I think that in India and other uh, countries, you have such applications uh, as well. Uh, and we uh, and now I would like to say a little bit about the about the my research uh, that it was uh, already started to be conducted and is still conducted. The main goal of this research was assessment of the role of uh, mobile uh, applications in creating consumer social responsibility. And there were some uh, uh, particular objectives stated as well um, to achieve this goal. So uh, in this, uh, uh, thanks to this research, uh, I wanted to uh, get an insight to consumers' approach to the issue of social responsibility in their purchasing decisions. At this first stage of the research, this concerns the uh, students' approach because uh, till now uh, the research was made among the was conducted uh, among the students. Um, uh, also, uh, would I would like to get the insight uh, to consumer to students. Let's say awareness of mobile applications, important social responsible purchasing decision. I want to, I wanted to check if they uh, already know such applications before the uh, research and also the evaluation of the usability of the applications while shopping and it was possible because of the experiment I made and the assessment of the applications impact on awareness on uh, students, let's say in a larger extent consumer social responsibility when making uh, purchasing uh, decisions. And here is the, a short 
uh, description of research methods. Uh, so the research was and still is conducted in 2021 among uh, so far um, more than uh, 100 students, but these uh, research uh, results uh, um, that I show, that concern 86 students from Warsaw University of Life Scientist. And the, the research, as I told, is not finished yet. And um, I realized that such a small sample um, needs to be extended. And this research will be also uh, conducted in another countries, not only in Poland. I achieved the interest from the researchers from uh, Philippines and from South Korea and from Ger Germany till now. And um, in this moment, if you are interested, I would like also to invite you to take part in this research in your, in your countries as well. I can give you the tool. Um, the tool is, the main tool is the, is our two online sur survey questionnaires. Uh, one of them, uh, is completed before using the applications. Then students start to um, test the uh, particular applications for two weeks. And after uh, the testing, they uh, complete another questionnaire. And it was how I received the preliminary results of the research. Um, uh, in Poland, we tested, uh, I tested, we tested with students uh, three applications. These uh, two of them, they are international. Uh, the most known is Banefree and Good on You. And one of them, it is a national one. It is in numbers. And um, uh, the, now I will provide some information on this uh, free application. I start off well-known application uh, Good on You. This application allows us to learn about the uh, ethical aspects of closing production. And this application supports sustainable development in the field of passion. So each brand receives a very easy to understand rating out of five points from we avoid, it is one point, or to great company, it is five points. And the individual scores as well for the it impact, uh, the company impact on people, planet, and animals. So we, in app, for example, um, uh, they analyze the practices of companies um, concerning the involvement of small children in work, concerning also the empl uh, employee safety, and the relationship uh, between the received salary uh, for the salary the workers receive and the possibility for them of subsistence uh, and other issues connected with working as well. And also the application draws attention to the carbon emission, uh, water and energy uh, consumption in the production process. And we can also find information um, on animal products um, uh, such as fur or uh, leather clothes. And these all issues mentioned have recently become a controversial, for, for example, this issue connected with using um, uh, 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 ch children to work or about the leather clothes. Um, and these uh, uh, issues are very media focused topics. So if uh, consumer, um, consumers want, they can check all this information using the uh, apps. And we have also the, um, the application, we have also tested the application Banifree. Banifree is an application that allows us to check whether cosmetics uh, or cleaning products have been tested on animals. And also, um, uh, it, is, uh, it is worth mentioning that it, this application is made by PITA, so the uh, P People for the Ethical Treatment and Animal Organization. This is a well-known world, uh, well worldwide organization. 
And uh, in this application, we can search for companies by categories, do not test on animals or uh, they test on animals uh, concerning the company. And um, we can also apply more uh, detailed uh, filtering, for example, uh, so-called warning for regulatory, uh, regulatory sorry, change. And this means searching for companies that minimize they use, but they minimize laboratory tests uh, on animals. That is, use them only when the policy of a given country requires such tests. As I mentioned before, we have uh, quite many of such countries in the world. And the application also allows us to scan product barcode. So it is easy to check if the product was, for example, a cosmetic was tested or a clinic product was tested or uh, not. And the third one application I mentioned, this is the application, national one ingredients Polish application that allows us to check the presence of chemical additives, dyes and regulators in the food uh, products. We can choose the healthiest product from among those that are proposed by the producers. And the application provides information on the symbols E-type, chemicals, ingredients, uh, uh, for sure that we don't know all the e ingredients, uh, what means the E uh, symbol, particular a symbol, a symbol, E symbol, and we can choose the, to check, sorry, this in such application. And we, uh, that such, this application, moreover, it is important that it provides uh, the uh, information about uh, possible side effect after a high consumption of food containing an additive. And the application searches for ingredients using three options. We can enter a symbol or chemical name, or we can scan the label with our uh, phone camera, or we can scan the product barcode. And uh, in this way, we can uh, get the access to the information uh, about the uh, whole additives in the product. And how we, how uh, in the research, the uh, level of consumer social responsibility was checked. It was checked basing on the already used in the scientific world scales here. And um, in the, the case of this research, um, at both uh, questionnaires contained previously used scales to assess consumer responsibility. Um, students were asked to write the same stat statements regarding social responsibility on a five point uh, liquor scale. And the statements was, were uh, proposed uh, before, were, that were proposed before by Francois Lecomte and Roberts, by Palacio Gonzalez and Chamorro Mera, and also by Verne Manero were used for uh, the assessment of students' social responsibility. And here you have examples of the statements that were put in the questionnaire and uh, were uh, evaluated by the um, students in the uh, five point meter scale. Uh, there was um, more uh, them than, uh, than are shown on this slide, but in this way, it was examined whether whether the ethical problems related to the purchase of a given brand's product are important for the students. Also, whatever they pay attention to the uh, composition of the product when shopping, or if students make sure that the producer were not the products sorry were not um, tested on animals. Well, uh, if it is uh, important for the student or if company caring for environmental uh, uh, issues or engaging the company in charity action is uh, an element important for students who are um, purchasing. And here I would like now at the end show some preliminary results of the research. I will not show any advanced statistics uh, for the time being, because as I mentioned before, the study is still conducted. But regarding this small sample of 86 students that, um, uh, that took part in this research, um, 
it has been noticed that the student's knowledge of mobile application is was uh, was no uh, low before testing applications. In the first questionnaire, nearly 90% of respondents indicated they know the vintage application. This one I mentioned that you can exchange or buy or, or uh, sell the clothes. And 50% of respondents of students declared that they knew the WIREC labels application. Um, and 20% uh, the, they knew the e-ingreen application, but the rest of the application, for example, banner free, choose cruelty free, boot on you, too good to go, and other mentioned in the questionnaire, they were not known uh, to the students, um, not at all, or they were known only for a very few uh, students. And based on the results of both studies, it was found that the declared responsibility of the uh, social behavior increased after testing mobile applications. And the result of the first survey showed that only 36 of the students could be considered socially responsible how, somehow, while the results of the secondary survey uh, indicated that 74% of such students after testing the, mobi uh, the mobile applications. And uh, I want also to add that uh, in order to assess the social responsibility of the students, a filter was used, uh, assuming that respondents, students with more than 50% of the answer, I fully agree of I agree in relation to the given statement uh, can be considered as a responsible. And the majority of the students, it was 85%, stated that uh, after testing the application, the consumer awareness in the context of social responsibility um, increased. And 95% um, respondents declared uh, that they had more knowledge about companies testing their products on animals. 50% of respondents started checking products labels after testing the application. And 73% uh, of respondents indicated that uh, it increased their knowledge of brands that deal ethically with their employees and in terms of their impact of environment. And um, the usability uh, of mobile application was set, assessed as satisfactory or very satisfactory by the majority of the respondents. Harry's rate, it was the uh, application uh, good on you from the, those three that were tested. And the respondents declared that they will use this, this tested application in the future. 65% uh, of students declared uh, that they want to use uh, these applications. And respond, they also agreed with the statement that mobile application affect, uh, affect socially uh, responsible uh, consumption, uh, they affect uh, conscious purchasing, um, and they agreed also with the statement that applications have an impact on sharing economy, which is based on exchange of goods and services between the consumers. Um, I realize that this study has many limitations. Uh, as I told, the sam research uh, sample will be larger in the future. Certainly, uh, continuing uh, this research in the future, we should reach more people with more different, di um, more age differences. But I think that still, uh, until now, the preliminary research results are promising. Um, in the uh, light of using the, uh, the mobile application as the uh, tool, as the instrument for learning and teaching social responsibility. Um, I want to only to add that I would also be inclined to conduct also qualitative research uh, after the use after the uh, quantitative research, the qualitative research would use uh, of focus groups in the case of non-users and light users of application and in order to achieve more insight, a deeper insight into the barriers of using such applications. 
and uh, also the I, IDI, so individual in-depth interview uh, in the case of heavy users of uh, such applications. Uh, here you have some references. I, um, I used to prepare this, um, this uh, presentation and also uh, to prepare the questionnaire. And uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, I hope uh, you found it, uh, this uh, presentation interesting. And uh, once again, I invite you to make such a study with me in your uh, countries. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, mm. Thank you, ma'am, for the deep introduction of the specific area your efforts and concern for the topic reflects in the speech. Your contribution to the area uh, is much more valuable for us. The concepts like human behavior, social responsibilities are very much inspiring. You explored a broad area of new researches also. Now, to end this program, I will uh, take the opportunity to propose the vote of thanks. Firstly, I would like to thank our first keynote speaker, Dr. Harvinder, Harvinder Soni for the valuable information sharing with us. Secondly, I would like to thank our speaker, Dr. Tania Lampau for the deep knowledge she has blessed with us. And the uh, research scholars present here will definitely take the valuable inspiration and inputs from the further uh, for the further research with your presentation ma'am. Thirdly, I would like to thank Dr. Anna Jesulevich for the invaluable ideas about the topic. Next, I would like to thank all the research scholars present here who have shown interest in taking the part in this event and made this event successful. Last but not the least, I would like to thank all the organizing team as well as the institutions who collaborated to make this event a huge success. Now, please take note that all the participants have 20 more days time till 20th December 2021 for submission of the final article or research paper for publication. Publication process will start after all selected articles, papers converted as per the standard publication format. Participants, presenters will receive an e-certificate till 3rd December 2021. Hard copy of the certificate and proceedings book after 25th December 2021. The tentative dates for the online publication is 25th December 2021. We are grateful for your presence with given time and efforts. Our well wishes for the future collaborations and participations are with you. The link of the program, uh, the feedback link of the program is given in the chat box by us. Please submit your response with a photo approach. I declare the session at